for the sake of at most completion is the full story. Now the prophet placed his hand again within the hands of human beings. We we'll just recap briefly before we go on to the next series of talks now that are these audience and they are very important. What the prophet did was he gave them a sense of purpose, gave them a sense of substantive life, that this life is a very, very important thing. Do not lose it. It's an opportunity. Now I often recite this hadith in the congregation, and I think it's good to recite it here. And Imam Sadi said, Salamu the greatest torment on the day of the Yah will not be the hell or the frightful event of the day of the Yah. The greatest torment on the day of the Yah will be the realization of missing out of the opportunity of life. So the greatest Allah on the day of the Yah will be the regret that the human being has in which he says that I have missed out on an opportunity. The sixty months said that they will cry with broken hearts. When their tears dry up, they will cry tears of blood for thousands of years until God's mercy prevails and He ushers them to the next rank of the Nukhaya. So what the Prophet did was he emphasized to them that look, this life is something hugely important. Two, in his teaching he says, then don't take anything as presumptuous, true. Anything based on presumption needs to be checked. So what if your poor partner did this? So what if your communities are doing this? So what if your chief tells you to do this? Is it right within itself? You have got the truth within yourself checking against that. What is the truth? The truth of self-realization. Am I becoming more godly through it all? Or is it more wasteful? Or is it stagnating me? Or is it counterproductive? So when I went what he did was, he took the onus of the burden of life from the hands of any other party and placed it in the hands of the human individual. And he said to the human individual in his Quran, that your destiny is entirely in your hand. Nobody else is going to make it for you. To the extent to which the Quran narrates that on the day of the Yama, Shaitan will say to the sons of Adam, don't blame me. Your destiny is in your hand. I merely showed you the candy, you came running to me. You already were predisposed to do this in your own thoughts. It is all the same whether we cry or whether we bear with dignity. Don't cry out to me. I'm not crying out to you, in this sense. We are all doomed to suffer this pain for what we have done. So the Prophet took away the onus of responsibility from third parties and put it on the human individual itself. He said, it's not good. When your intuition tells you what is right with the Quran sings this. The Quran says, the human sees well within his own soul what is right and what is wrong, even though he presents thousands of excuses. He knows that the core is right and what is wrong. So the Prophet was he placed this burden of responsibility upon the human individual because he said there is a huge task at hand. You need to be actualized. You can only be actualized by taking responsibility and taking it very seriously and owning up to wrong decisions that you make and the right decisions that you make, then I'm not worried. The whole of that process connected God very, very intimately. <coughs> he stated that, look, this life of yours is to a great extent ordained for you. All you have to do is to find this life as an opportunity to ignite your own humanity and to come to your own completion to the opportunities of life and to the challenges of life. So this was the life he created. And in that, he got the end again. He made moral agents and spiritual agents out of animal-like nomadic paths. He made them value knowledge for people who did not know how to read or write. He made them value life for people who took life so easily. He made them value the pain of others, the people who used to bury their daughters without a sense of sin or grief or pain. He ignited within them godliness. He made God their physical. He made God their friend, he made God their intimate companion. That was the end game. How did he do it? Initially, we said he was a human factor. Take responsibility. Make God an intimate friend of yours. 
know that there is a higher purpose. Know that you should be involved. Know that if you give you, you know what is right or is wrong. Yes? And the second level, he formulated this growth process through things which were tools that assisted this growth process. These are known as the Ahkam, the regulations of Islam. This is now the tool that will take forth from now to the end in a critique of the Ahkam and their practices that are associated with the Imami and the Prophet in particular, but with Muslims in general. Yes? And the people of other faiths will also find this very, very relevant to this critique. So what were Ahkam? Straight off. Anything that does not add to the process of self-realization and self-accomplishment and liberation of the liberating factor is not fulfilling a purpose. Can you see that? So any ahkam has a yard, any regulation, we're going to go into this very story, any regulation has a yard state that it has to be growth promoting and it has to be fashioned in a very real human sense. If it is not growth promoting, it becomes useless. It can be replaced. But the accounts have another few facets that we are going to discuss. They are meant to take the human individual and human community from a state of weakness into a state of strength. Weakness means potential, strength means accomplishment. Yes? A child is born in the cradle of weakness, arrives as an adult in the point of strength, an adult in the point of weakness spiritually arrives at the point of strength towards the end of their lives when they become fully spiritual. It makes no sense that I say, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, at the age of 20, and I don't move. And at the age of 50, when I say, Ya Rabbi, and I don't move. And he said, when I say, Ya Rabbi, the throne of God should move with me. The angels should move So he's taking us from weakness into strength. That is how the Ahkam system was formulated. Now, the Prophet placed his Ahkam in a way that was a general understanding of Islam. Now, in the beginning of lectures, it will be described, and that's what we want to take it on from. We say that, that in the growth process of the vertical axis, and there is a horizontal axis. The vertical axis is the intimate connection of the individual and God. And the individual has to always flow towards God to utmost completion. Material completion, intellectual completion, moral completion, emotional completion, spiritual completion. The horizontal are is the axis of Ahkam that suggests how the vertical one will take place. And that's why we find in the human history we had Ibrahim, we had Nu, replaced by Ibrahim, replaced by Moses. Replaced by Isa, replaced by the Prophet of Islam. But none of them have touched the vertical axis. None of them. They have all maintained that the vertical axis is the central one. Your self realization and growth towards your God is central, whether you are an individual or a collective body. The only thing they have changed is the horizontal axis. On the horizontal axis, they said, this is now the new way of going about the vertical. See that? They've always suggested a new Sharia. New Sharia has always come and replaced each other on the horizontal to assist the vertical with the changing of the human society and human mind. For sure, you cannot sustain the curiosity of a growing child by giving them the same textbook that you gave them in their primary education. In their secondary education, you would have to replace the textbooks with those who are far more sophisticated. Because they've already digested the level of knowledge that they were given at the level of primary education. And at the level of college, it will be replaced again. At the level of university, it will be replaced again. But the central theme, the vertical of self-realization, of gaining knowledge, <coughs> of self-actualization, is the one that can never be changed. The students is on the vertical trend. The horizontal axis are momentary, replacing each other in order to accomplish the vertical one. The prophet was very, very mindful of this. And that is why the fashion in Afghan system in a way that will fulfill this particular 
trend within human growth. Now, how do these Adam behave? First of all, they are all geared towards bringing the human community and human individual to the fullest of their self advantage. But through the horizontal axis within Islam, Islam realizes that the human being is an individual and as much as an individual is a collective body. Think about this carefully. As human beings in this world, the whole system of right can only come about in a collective context. Cultures. Cultures cannot be in an individual context. They are always in the context of the collective body. So many of our human existence makes no sense without the context of a community. So community is as important as the individual. One feeds the other and both of them have beautiful reciprocal relationships. Without the context of a community, nothing makes sense of human life. And without the individual, the community doesn't make sense. The prophet is mindful of both of these factors. So the vertical one is of realization. So the horizontal ones are the actor within the individual and the communal context together. And at the same time, he is mindful that in the community, we are also individuals. And see how beautifully he is doing this. I'm going to give a very small example that we go into this video because quite philosophical. The Prophet says, or one of the Imams, he said, when you pray in Jamaat, pray quickly, let people go. That is communal spirituality. There you are supposed to meet with each other, talk and socialize. Let worship not become a burden on you. But when you're alone, in your dwarfing, perform lengthy hokus and lengthy sujus. For that is the true growth of an individual. The communal growth is a different type of growth. Individual growth is a different type of growth in case you need to The Quran says, O Yazir, Sahaj Yazir, O Yazir, Sahaj 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 At night, do the night prayer. Your God may elevate you to a praise worthy rank, but that is a voluntary prayer. Allah SWT never gives us guarantees, such lofty rewards for the communal prayer, does not it? He has a different sense of spirituality. And the individual has a different sense of spirituality. And he has beautifully brought them both together. However, in the horizontal, when it comes to collective existence, which is a part and parcel of our nature, the way the Prophet formulates the law has to be in accordance with the growth property. It has to be in accordance with growth property. However, however, and this is how the law system works. And this is the beauty of the prophetic vision. You see, me and you are totally mistaken. We think that there is an absolute point that we have to be. We have to pray namaz like this with the open hands and not shake and not tremble and all of that. The prophetic logic saw things very, very differently. He understood that the human existence is one in flux. It's always moving. So there will always be scope for error. And he empowered people to make error. He actually gave them confidence to try their best and to make error. This evolutionary flux presumes a state of error. And that's why the imami scholarship is based, jurisprudential scholarship is based on the principle of error. I call it the evolutionary flux. I will explain that later on. In the vertical, the law system behaves in terms of majority growth. Certain individuals may not find it relevant, but in that context, the majority will find it relevant and it adds to the individual growth. So, for example, let's give a very simple example. On the roads of Los Angeles or California, you will find speed limits. Now, a person may feel they are fully in control of the car that they are driving and they can drive at 150 kilometers per hour or miles, whatever we have here, and without harming any other road user, but they will be penalized for it because the law has to work for the majority. It doesn't apply to the one odd individual. So this was the law system that he set, ahkam that he set in place. That ahkam have to work for majority, in which the individual might feel suffocated, but then the individual's growth is ensured through the growth of the majority. How? Let's point it out very simply. If everyone were to take the liberty 
of driving their cars at 150 miles per hour in a 50-hour zone, can you imagine the crisis that could result as, uh, that, that, that can uh, come out as a result of this? Can you imagine the hazard that would be caused upon the road? So therefore, it is in the best interest of everybody that everybody attains and adheres to that particular limit that is well for everyone. So some people might feel, well, I can do this and I can do that. Well, no, it doesn't work for majority. That, intuitively, we know is right. And the Ahkam system has been no different to that. On the other hand, he also realizes the beauty of the human existence. So he brings in individual cultures and collective cultures. He is mindful of relativity and plurality. And these are huge things when we come to the level of discussion. If you look at Hajj, Hajj does away with every form of distinction, doesn't it? Two garments, there is no black or white, male, female, rich, poor, learned, ignorant. Everyone is equal at that point. It's the most universal culture that we understand within the Islamic practices. The culture of the Ummah as the Ummah. At the same time, we are in our own cultures. Don't you see? In this little hall, we have formed a culture. A culture of sitting for the next 45 minutes without being agitated, nodding at the Molana, assuring him that we are understanding everything you're saying. We're not getting bored to death, Salwat. We've got a culture, but inside our houses, we have a very limited culture, don't we? So what he did was, he understood that and placed it in his ahkam system, and he honors them all, that you are individuals, you have individual cultures, you have collective cultures. Simultaneously, they must coexist, and you must know how to fluctuate from one to the other, and how to adjust and balance yourselves. So he brings in these beautiful cultures. And that creates relativity. Different people have different ways of life, provided they are all falling within the principle of the growth property. They are fine, provided they are mindful of the horizontal axis and they know the bigger cultures as they encounter them. That's absolutely fine. Now, the Quran actually also points at this. In one of the verses, it says, They can't all come to you. Then why not does there come out a few people from every group and learn from you and then go back? Now this is also pointing at that beautiful point of relativity. That relativity is there in the minds. We will all understand the same thing in a very different way. One word is said, we all listen, to, we all hear it in a different, we all hear it in the same way, but digest it in accordance with our own personal points of references. And in this way, the Prophet is mindful that different people understand things differently. So although an overall culture embraces them of salah, of fast, of this, of that, they are very individualistic as well. And this will yield plurality. So he is mindful and he's integrating all of this inside his beautiful Islam. Now beyond that, there are one or two things at the theoretical level we need to discuss. Now, I'm just trying to make a point that the ahkam are the final part of his message, yes? A very important part, if understood properly. Do you know, incidentally, out of the 6,666 verses, how many verses are for Ahkam? 500? Out of that, how many are very, very clear? Very, very few. Something that has been given the least importance within the Quran has become the obsession of the Muslim mind. Can you see that? The Muslim mind will say, if I don't pray like this, you know, like a statue, if I move, my taqwiratul ihram is not accepted. But after the prayer, the Muslim doesn't become a better person. He still cheats, he still lies, he still swears, he still curses. Surely, if the Muslim was waving his hand and said, Allahu Akbar, and after that, he became a better person, that that waving of the hand is better than being stagnant like a statue and praying a prayer that is totally meaningless. The Muslim's obsession with ahkam is the obsession with the form, and he has forgotten the essence altogether. There are a few things we need to mention at this theoretical level, but I'll give another example. A Muslim is one who looks at the mirror, but doesn't look inside the mirror. 
He starts polishing the mirror and forgets that he has to look inside the mirror and that is the real function of the mirror. The Muslim prays namaz, salah for the sake of salah. The Muslim goes around the Kaaba for the sake of going around the Kaaba. The Muslim does things that don't make sense anymore. He slaughters animals in hundreds of thousands upon which we walk and a pool of blood comes up to our knees. But he says, we are supposed to slaughter an animal here. <laughs> what purpose is it serving? In Hajj, what purpose does it serve? The Muslim is obsessed with hitting the shaitan. That it has to be on the middle pillar. He doesn't even realize that there was no pillar in the time of the Prophet. He doesn't even realize that there was no pillar in the time of the Prophet. And he wants to hit the middle pillar, but doesn't realize that he has supposed to make that intention that, Oh Lord, I cast this stone as a symbolic gesture for you to assist me to overcome my own inadequacies. I can't control my anger. Henceforth, you assist me. I'm going to consciously trying to address my anger problem. He just wants to make sure that his stone falls on the middle one. That's it. And even if it falls somewhere else, I'll have to throw it again. And ends up throwing 20 stones instead of 7 stones. But have those stones, 20 stones added to the vertical? Have they? Today's Muslim, I'll just digress slightly. Today's Muslim is led by the whip. Honestly. Islam was for noble man. Man of dignity and pride. Yes. Ibn Arabi, when he became Badig, he actually distributed sweets. They said, why? He said, At now I am held accountable by my Lord. At least my Lord will take notice of me now. Until now, my Lord was not ready to take notice of me. I am elated with joy that my Lord is saying to me, you are worthy of talking with me. But the Muslim child is told, if you don't pray, you're going to get this and that and whatever else you're going to get. Where? Is that Islam that came for noble man and noble souls? And where is this Islam that is led by the whip, this Islam of thugs? That was Islam of noble men. Forgive me for using harsh language, salawat. So he placed these laws. Now these laws, and we have to discuss one or two more facets. These laws are at the bottom. The laws function was, or the ahkam's function, the regulations function was what? To bring about the best of humanity, to trigger off self-realization, self-actualization in a communal and an individual capacity. They have always been changing, yes? They have always been changing in history from Musa to Isa to Rasulullah. They've always been changing. I'm not saying go out and change our laws. I'm not saying that at all. My point is something different and I'll point out at the yardstick that we don't change any of these laws. But we address the laws that don't make sense anymore. The practices and the cultures that are defeatist, that are stagnating us or putting us in a regressive trend. And that has become the face of Islam right now. The Prophet was mindful of the system of laws that how they can change. But look at the beauty and the brilliance of the mind of the Prophet. He was so flexible. He did not have any parameters. He broke through every boundary just as the human nature wants to break through every boundary. Just as a tree wants to break through every mold. Just as a fetus wants to break through every caste. Just as everything in this world wants to break through every confined state. So what happened was, a person, I'm going to give very small examples. A person came from Persia and he was wearing pajamas. The Arabs did not have the notion of pajamas and trousers. So the people laughed at him. The Prophet said, no, it's a very dignified state. It's a very dignified garment. We will uphold it. He was so flexible. He did not say, this is mine and this is not mine and this is alien to me. He did not say, Islam that I'm giving you in the ahkam has come to complete it. It's all lock, stock and barrel. He stated, no, this is an evolutionary process. Whatever is good, take it on. Learn. He actually encouraged the system of progressive thinking to the extent that the imams encouraged the import of Greek knowledge, logic, and philosophy. Imagine. To the extent that the Sunni brothers have a hadith that the Prophet said Plato and Aristotle, sorry, Socrates, Plato, are prophets. Learn from them. He was very different to the way we are. Do you know today the American culture is a beautiful culture? 
It is flexible. It allows different colors to come inside it and to remodel it once again. The prophet's mindset was like this. He allowed blacks, whites, Persians, all of them to bring their richness within Islam. And Islam was a meaningful religion that was evolving, that was blooming, that was coming to fruition at every point. And Allah says that in the Quran, doesn't he? That the example of a good word, شَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَ أَصْلُهَا sabit wa فِي السَّمَاءِ تُؤْتِ أُكُلُهَا كُلَّ حِينٍ The good word is like a tree whose roots are firm. What are these firm roots? These universal principles whose branches stretch out towards the sky and give fruit at every instance. This fruit at every instance means expressions that allow growth at every point. Of course, I'm interpreting this in my own theory and in my own uh, sort of uh, framework. But think about it. This is how broad the Prophet was. And in the Prophet's Islam, <coughs> it was a very realistic Islam in which he had place for real human existence. It was symbolic and it was abstract. The Prophet gave a lot of value to symbolism. He did not frown upon it. And the Prophet gave extreme value to abstractness, being alone with God without any color. So he would say, in my mosques, in the mosques, don't adorn them with gold and silver, so that the mind is not distracted at that point. Face yourselves towards the Kaaba and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, he did not reject all these sentiments of people keeping clothes of their deceased, so on and so forth. He actually acknowledged all of that as a part and parcel of human need. This is how he set up his ahkam system. It was directly in line with the human condition and human nature and directly meant to promote the vertical trend of growth and of self-realization. What he came and gave was not the beginning and the end of it all. What he did was he set off a trend. Now what we find in the law and the akam of the Prophet is a minimalistic system. A minimalistic system. Look at the laws of marriage. They are minimalistic. He said as you evolve, you will make your own regulations that suit you best in governing you and your own evolutionary growth. So he placed the most minimum regulations within his law system. And in fact, majority has, of it has been misunderstood. If you look, Islam is a humanitarian religion. The Arabs used to practice ilah and dhihar, the forms of torturing women and not giving them their rights. Islam immediately came and modified them and said, if you do ilah and dhihar, there is this penalty on you and then you will have to divorce your wives. And then Surah Baqarah says, if they are not happy with each other, then let the woman give her dowry back and let her be separated. He never ever placed that york of oppression on the woman's head that the man has to, has to um, divorce her. In fact, Tusi goes as far as to say that this is a form of revocation of marriage. He doesn't even require divorce. It's so in line and in tune with human nature. He actually set off a trend of evolutionary growth. He did not come to complete it. As one of Ayatollah Muntazari's students has said, that the Prophet did not come to conclude the discussion on women's rights. He merely initiated it. And I say he initiated it in the evolutionary trend. You know, nowadays we say, if a marja feels benevolent, if, if a person like me feels benevolent, I will dig my hand inside the bag of rights and say to a woman, ha, ah, henceforth this is also your right. And the poor creature of God is elated with joy that this man gives me more right. Rights are not to be given. Rights are based on capacities. Existential capacities procure rights. If there's a brilliant female mind, it is the community's right upon that female to contribute in accordance with what she has to contribute in order to give growth to that community. It's not a question of giving her her right to contribute or not. So the Prophet, he sets off this beautiful evolutionary system in which there is a beautiful state of flux, but he brings in minimalistic laws. Tell me, and I often ask this to my audience, who say that Islam is complete. I will say, look, Allah says, Al yom akmaltu lakum di no kum. I have completed your religion for you. He doesn't say I have completed my religion. Yes? And I've complete my, completed my favors on you, and I'm happy for Islam to be your religion. 
when people said that this was the ahkam system that he's talking about, Tabatabai and other scholars, notable scholars, they all point out in the tafsirs that many ahkam were revealed after that ayat was revealed. Both Sunni and Shia, both of them say it. Both the Sunni and Shia say that these verses were revealed either at Arafah, either at Makkah, or either at Khadir. But subsequent to that verse, those, this verse, the Prophet lived and gave many, gave many other ahkam before his death. So how can Islam have been completed in terms of the law system? He was talking, God was talking about something totally different. And he made it a very relativistic thing. I've completed your religion for you. And I'm pleased for Islam to be your religion. What that meant was Islam as you have understood it. Not Islam as it is in its glory. Islam in its fullest glory is a human religion. In a hadith that talks about the 12th Imam, it says, Salamullah Ali. That when that benevolent head of the community reappears, his task will not be to make you pray salah, fast, give zakat, or do hajj. You will already have matured by that time to understand the worth of all these things. He will merely come and place his hand upon your heads and drive your intellects towards their completion. That has been the sole purpose of religion. To complete the human existence. I often ask my audience, what is the economy of Islam? Sociology of Islam? Politics of Islam? Answer me. Nobody has an answer. Is there a Quranic chapter that says, Iktisadul Islami? Ijtima al-Islamiyya? Siyasatul Islami? Is there? There isn't. What, what is meant by this is that we were supposed to, in our evolutionary trend, create different social, political, economical systems that work and they assist our growth and are based on justice and fair play. Social justice and fair play. And as soon as we find that we have grown beyond this system, the system has to redefine itself and modify itself. And this is exactly what we see in human history. Monarchy, feudalism, capitalism, communism, against modified, modified version of capitalism, again a modified version of communism, <laughs> socialism. Aren't we finding this? It's an evolutionary trend. The onus was left on the human mind. The ahkam were minimalistic. They only spoke of principles. The principle is one of growth. The principle one is, of, is one of fair play and justice for one and all. Social justice. The rest is your invention. And there was a reason why the prophet left it at the minimalistic stage. So that the human mind can evolve through its own experience. And the prophet empowered through his system the human beings to make mistakes, the process of trial and error. Imagine, today the Muslims say, our economy is the best economy, and I will say, well, where is your economy? Honestly, where is your economy? Our social system is, is the best social system. I'll say, well, look, if I go to Iran, I really can't buy a house without an Iranian national buying it for me. I come to a place which I call godless, and I have equal rights. If I go to Iraq, I can't become the president of Iraq, yes? If I'm not born in that system, or if, I don't, if I'm not an Iraqi, uh, forgive me if, if it's changed now. But if I go to America, I can become the president of America and sit inside the White House. So where is that fair play within the Muslims who claim that they are the whole stakeholders of the truth and who are the Muslims? Where is it? Why is there so much poverty? When Islam was the sword against poverty, wasn't it? Islam was the first one to speak about human rights. The prophet spoke about human rights, didn't he? The rights of women, the rights of children, the rights of animals, the right of land, the right of the other who is a non-Muslim. Wasn't he the one who initiated the whole of the discourse of human rights in the most prominent way? Wasn't he the one who put the seeds of democracy in the properest way? Maybe we can describe that at a later date. Where is it all in Islam? The fact is, he came and gave minimalistic ahkam regulations. And these ahkams were based on the vertical growth property. And they were supposed to fluctuate. Now, if somebody is finding this difficult to digest and thinking, well, where is this man going with it all? Maybe I can give an example. The age of maturity of a girl was nine at the time of the Prophet, nine lunar years. By the time of Imam Sadiq, he says, no, it's 13. Why did he do that? Why did he change it? He said, no, it's 13. Why did he do this? Did he not understand the Prophet more than anybody else? 
Why did he do this? I'll leave this question in your minds. In Mina, people approached him and they said, can we move the meat from Mina? He said, look, my grandfathers used to say, keep the meat of Mina within Mina because there were many, many poor who judged they needed to be fed. But now, with the level of affluence and the number of hujjaj, take the meat out of Mina. Why do the ulama not understand the full implications of this hadith? Didn't Imam Sadiq know what he was doing, what he was saying? Imam Sadiq finds himself in a global context. I always say this, if the Twelvers had any sense, they would invest in only one person, Imam Sadiq. That man is a giant. Truly is a giant of humanity. The sort of learning he displays, I have not found in the history of mankind. He was in a global context. The things that he said were phenomenal, phenomenal. He said, do Eid, one Eid with the people of Qibla, with the people of La ilaha illallah, with the people of Salah. People would tell him, it's our fifth fast, it's your fourth fast. He said, it's fine, I will consider this my fifth fast and I will do a qadha at the end. He was in a global context. Why did he change the forms? The ahkam are form, self-realization, achievement of actuality, godliness, progression of the whole community is the essence. He was mindful of these things. The prophetic laws were minimalistic. Why did Imam Sadiq change it? Or even gesture towards changing it. I'm going to bring in Imam Sadiq in a very big way in the later lectures to try and understand how we can deal with it afresh. But the point is, that the Prophet based his ahkam system on the human condition. And he set off a trend of evolution. Now I made this point in the lectures of human Islam, that truly, if humanity was evolving from Adam to the Prophet of Islam, and as a result, there was a need of revising the Sharia system, the horizontal. Are you telling me that from the time of the Prophet till now, human beings have not evolved intellectually? Seriously? Are you telling me they have not evolved? I'm not saying there aren't any salient features to the ahkam. There are huge salient features which we will discuss afterwards. Because his ahkam system is also divided in a few, uh, in a few categories. And the most prominent are the devotions, the consumables, something that nobody touches but even they go through an evolutionary track as we will explain at some point. But others were mu'amalat, interactions, which are always changing. Tell me, when the Prophet came to this world, he came without a context or in a living context. He came within a language, didn't he? So he spoke in a language that was already pre-existing. Those languages had words and meanings. He used them all. And then he made slight modifications. He came in a world in which there was marriage and divorce. He modified it slightly, but the context was overwhelmingly existing. He came in a context in which transaction was taking place. He merely modified that transaction to make it fair play. And you're telling me that since the time of the Prophet till now, the whole nature of transactions has not changed? Dealing with bonds and futuristic bonds have got no similarity to the transactions that the Arabs were accustomed to. It's a new ball game altogether. We can't take it back to Arabia, 7th century Arabia, and try and resolve these problems there. They are fresher questions. The law system was minimalistic. It had its few categories. Some we will not touch, like devotions. But we can touch the meanings of devotions and the parameters of it. For example, do you think, and I'm going to ask a question, if it's sensitive, then forgive me when my time is finished. In a region where daytime is only two hours, okay, you know that there are such regions in the northern Europe. The prophet comes hypothetically, and I'm going to use hypothetic Islam as one of the tools as well. The Prophet comes hypothetically and he says, fasting has been prescribed for you. From, from dawn to sunset, people would laugh. They would say, well, what do you mean from dawn to sunset? It's only two hours. We don't eat for four hours and you're forcing us to eat after two hours? I know people will be agitated by this question. But go home and think about it. Go home and think about it. Is it productive? Is it on the vertical trend? Does it serve a communal purpose? Does it bring growth to the individuals? Will the people not say, Ya Rasulullah, you're asking me to fast. And in that fast, there's supposed to be some good for me. What good is there in that? So the devotions we will not touch unless 
they are coming to defining the devotion. And that's when we will discuss a little bit of them. So now, Ahkam's whole role was to be based on that theory and geared towards allowing human individuals in their individual and communal capacities to fully realize themselves and become godly creatures. Ahkam can never ordain cheating others, lying, stealing. Ahkams can never ordain these things. Ahkam can never ordain something that is useless or something that is grossly detrimental. Fasting of a nine-year-old girl for 20 to 22 hours is hugely detrimental. Ahkams can never ordain such things. They are not right. Ahkam stand at the lowest level in order to attain that godliness. And I'll throw in something which will truly baffle the minds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran gives equal salvation to the Jews, Christians and the Sabians. And somebody comes over, the Jews and the Christians don't follow any of these things. Why do they have equal salvation? The point is that a Muslim has such an opportunity of salvation that no other faith has. If only they were to understand their Islam. It's like a child who can get a degree and another one who can get a first class degree. It is like a student at the university who can become a professor or he can become Einstein in Newton. That's the distinction and difference. If only this Islam were to be understood. I firmly believe that such actualized people existed with Hussein ibn Ali Salamullah in his Karbala. Today is the mention of the one who breaks the heart of Hussein into thousands of pieces, after which his heart never regained its peace. Habib ibn Madahir. His name is Habib, the beloved, and indeed he is Habib of Hussein. In his childhood, we find this narration that the Prophet looked at Hussein ibn Ali and he saw children playing around Hussein ibn Ali. He observed and he said, bring that child to me. They brought Habib to the Prophet. The Prophet kissed the hands and the face of Habib. They said, Ya Rasulullah, why do you shower such affection on him? Whereas all of them are equal. He said, you did not see what I saw. I saw him walking behind Hussein, trying to save Hussein at every point. This is how much he loves my son Hussein. Hussein is either approaching Karbala or is inside Karbala. Zainab sees the gathering forces of the enemies. She comes to Hussein. She says, Oh brother, do you not have anybody that you can call upon to assist you? This is that sentiment of a sister. I will say, Zainab, no matter how many people your brother calls, he will not be spared the fate that awaits him. No, oh sister, who may I have in this wilderness? But, oh brother, you have a childhood friend, Habib ibn Madahir. Hussein writes a letter from Hussein to Habib, a man who is a faqih, who is the qari of the Quran. Oh Habib, I am trapped in Karbala. Do not prefer your life above my life. You know the kinship I enjoy with the Prophet. O Habib, hasten to me before it is late. He dispatches this letter to Habib. The Qasid of Hussein, the messenger, comes at night. Kufa is under heavy guard. This is what we hear from the Dakirin. Habib sits inside his house. There is a knock at the door. And Habib asks, who may this be at this hour? He said, I, the messenger of Hussein. Habib runs to the door, opens the door, receives the letter, kisses it, reads its content, and folds it away. Comes back inside the house. His wife asks, Oh Habib, who was it? It was the messenger of Hussein with a message for me. What does it say? Hussein is trapped and seeks my help. What do you intend? 
He looked at her and said, I worry about you. She said, Habib, sorrow be your lot. The sons and daughters of Fatima are facing death and you worry about your wife? Oh Habib, do you not find the resolve to give your life for Hussein? He said, oh dear one, I was merely testing you and your faith. Habib sends his steed with his slave to wait for him at the borders of Kufa. He secretly makes way. He meets Muslim ibn Ausaja. Muslim ibn Ausaja had bought henna to color his beard. Muslim said, oh Habib, do you have any further news of Hussein? He is in Karbala trapped. A battle is imminent. Muslim throws the henna and he says, by Allah, I shall color this white beard with my own blood in the defense of Hussein ibn Ali. Habib is delayed in coming to the border of Kufa. As he approaches, he sees his slave talking to Habib's horse and says, O oh, faithful, worry not. If your master does not approach, I shall saddle you and ride to Karbala to give our lives for Hussein ibn Ali. Habib is moved by this scene. He says, I free you in the way of Allah. He said, if you free me, then take me with you. Habib said, then accompany me. Meanwhile, Hussein prepares standards and he distributes standards, but reserves one for himself. The rest of the commanders are envious. They say, Hussein, hand us over the standard of your army. He said, no, the bearer of this standard is soon to approach. Who may he be, they asked. And as soon as they said that, they saw a cloud of dust arise through the beating of the hooves of a horse. Hussein smiled. He said, he is the one who arrives. As Habib comes near Hussein, he looks at Hussein. And he said, even though I've become old and unable, a single glance at your face, O Hussein, fills my blood with you, fills my veins with youthful blood. There was commotion within the camp of Hussein. When the women heard these noises rise and happiness, Zainab said, What is the cause of this? She was told the childhood friend of Hussein has arrived, Habib ibn Mabayr. Zainab sends her salutations with Fizza. When Fizza comes and salutes Habib, Habib begins to weep at the fate that awaited Zainab. He slaps his face and he says, Oh, for the sorrow that has befallen us. How should Zainab, the daughter of the Prophet, send her salutation to me or me? It is the day of Ashura. The mutual com the combat has come to a stage where Hussein has lost most of his helpers. It's a time for prayer. Sayyidawi reminds Imam Hussein, it is Dhuhr. The Imam looks at the sky and he says, Indeed, may Allah raise you with the Musalleen as you have reminded me of prayer. He says, go and take permission from the enemies to let us pray. Hasin bin Namir said, Hussein, pray as much as you want. They shan't be accepted. Habib retorted, he said, Hussein bin Namir, O oh, drunkard, shall they be accepted from you and not from the grandson of the Prophet? Hussein prepared for prayers. Habib looked at Hussein. He said, even though I know prayers are obligatory upon me, but I desire to pray with your grandfather and father. Allow me to leave. Hussein stands and allows Habib to leave. Habib comes into the battlefield in single combat and cries out, I am Habib, the son of Madahir. By Allah, had we been your equal or half your numbers, you would have turned your backs to us and fled for your lives. I am from a household who hosts our guests. Sorrow be your lot. For putting the son of the prophet to this, into this state. He mounted an attack. Eventually the enemies came in, mute, in great numbers towards him. It is said that Habib fought gallantly. Until one of the armies surrounding him struck the back of his head with his sword. And another one struck a spear in his chest. Habib came to the ground. And as he tried to stand. Hasin bin Namir struck him again upon his head. As Habib fell, he said, Assalamu alaykum, ya Aba Abdullah. 
O Aba Abdullah, accept my final salutations as I bid farewell to you. Hamid ibn Muslim says, as he heard the cry of Habib, his resolve broke and I saw the anguish and the pain on the face of Hussein ibn Ali. And he cried out aloud as he ran towards Habib. He came to Habib and he took the head of Habib inside his lap. And he said, oh Habib, you are a noble man. You read the whole Quran through the night. Oh Habib, shall you leave your friend so abruptly? Habib breaks into a smile. Hussein said, what be the cause of your smile? He said, oh Hussein, this is your grandfather. Quenching me with the goblets of Kothar. And saying to you, O oh Hussein, hasten to me. For the weight is unbearable. Allah la'anthu la'al al-qawm al-zalimeen. Wa sayya'alamu al-ladhina thalamu wa yamun qalabiyyan qalibun. Matam Hussein.